Now I'd like to hand over to the team and to Matt, um, who will start us off. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Matt, and I'm presenting a little bit of background information on our study, Enhancing Self-Disclosure of Equity Group Membership. Um, and a few of the initial results we've already got, which look quite positive in terms of identifying trends within the, equity, the three equity groups we're looking at. Um, so first of all, um, Australia's tertiary sector has grown phenomenally in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And along with that, students that are members of equity groups have increased several fold. Um, um, this includes students from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, um, women in non-traditional areas such as engineering and STEM fields, people from non-English speaking backgrounds and people living with disabilities and people from rural and isolated areas. Um, this study focuses on three equity groups out of those six. So we're looking at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, also known as Indigenous students, students who are living with a disability or disabilities, and students who are from non-English speaking backgrounds but are domestic students. So that is all students from non-English speaking backgrounds who aren't international students. Um, for a few statistics, um, at last count in 2015, there were just over a million university students in Australia. Of this, 40,281 were from non-English speaking backgrounds, so that's 3.9% of the population. Um, and according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics in 2016, 27% of the total Australian population were from non-English speaking backgrounds. So those figures aren't quite representative of the wider population. Students with living with disabilities included 60,019 students, which is 17.25% of the total population. And the ABS in 2016 found that about 18.5% of the Australian population were living with a disability at any given time. So those figures are pretty representative of wider trends in Australia, which is promising. Um, finally, 15,585 Indigenous students were enrolled in 2015, which is 1.6% of the total university population. Um, Indigenous peoples represent about 3% of the total Australian population as well. So within our equity focus group, at last count in 2015, this includes approximately 115,000 students, which make up about 22.75% of the total university population. So this is a significant number of students, a significant proportion of students we're looking at and the insecurities and issues that they face. Why, do, why disclose and importantly, what is disclosure? Well, disclosure is telling your institution or telling people in that institution that make decisions that you are from an equity group usually to meet some sort of need that you have. So if you're a student living with a disability, it might be to access accommodations. Uh, if you're an Indigenous or Torres Strait Islander student, it might be to access uh, particular scholarships or funding opportunities or for sensitivities surrounding your culture. And if you're from a non-English speaking background, it might be for English assistance or just for statistical purposes. We've identified four broad reasons why students tend to disclose. So one is to access support and targeted programs. One is to be part of a community, which seems to cover a lot of Indigenous students. Meeting peers as well who share your insecurities, your vulnerabilities, and who understand what you're, what you're facing at university, and a recognition of your identity. Um, we've also got a quote here from a student with a disability that they'd like to be treated with respect and dignity and they don't want to be questioned, considered as liars, or wanting a free ride. So there are significant hesitations when it comes to disclosure as well, but these are the four broad reasons we could identify so far. Despite the benefits of disclosure, though, a significant proportion of this population doesn't disclose. So what our research has uncovered so far is about 9.7 or 10% of students living with a disability haven't told their institution about that, haven't made themselves visible to their institution. 13.6% of Indigenous students and 16.5% of students from non-English speaking backgrounds. So this population is largely invisible to the university. Um, processes and intervention programs don't see these students and 
we have very little information on the needs of these students and why or why not they disclose. Um, and of course, this, this causes a lot of confusion for service provision and accommodation as well as funding because there simply are gaps in how many students we know have these issues. We've got a few reasons here given by students in our surveys of why, these, why this group may or may not disclose though, um, which identifies differences between these groups. So the first is I don't know how to disclose this information and we see here in the graph a huge proportion of non-English speaking background students don't know how to disclose. Less so for students with disabilities, less so for Indigenous. I'm not going to walk you through all of these graphs because I think um, it would be quicker just to read it. But if I flick to the next slide, we've got some very interesting results here. Um, what this spider web graph tells us, for example, is that students with disabilities, if you look in the bottom right corner, fear prejudice in their professional life and in their university life the most out of these three equity groups. Far more than non-English speaking background students and far more than Indigenous students who appear to fear that very little. However, if you look at the bottom left, students with disabilities and non-English speaking background students certainly do fear much more than Indigenous students being labelled. Um, whether that's for fear of discrimination or whether Indigenous students fear that less because that Indigenous label is how they access a lot of targeted services, that's a room for further study and for further research. And if you look at the far left of the graph at about 9 o'clock, I don't know how, why I should disclose this information. So why disclose? What do I get for it? Well, non-English speaking background students see the least reason to disclose in terms of why they should. Uh, indigenous students just after that and students with disabilities seem to have least issues with deciding what they should get for their disclosure, which is possibly because they receive a lot of targeted programs depending on how and when they disclose. Those are just a few examples. Um, of course, the university does not need to know is another example at about 8 o'clock on this graph. Um, and disclosing the status at 12 o'clock on the graph to university benefits students. Uh, we see students with disabilities or Indigenous students most firmly approve of that and students from non-English speaking backgrounds see relatively less reason to disclose in terms of benefiting other students. Um, so taken together, the findings so far suggest that the fear of labelling is equally shared by the three focus groups. We'll just go back to the spider graph for a second and have a look at this. Not wishing to be labelled. Although there is a difference with Indigenous students, they all do report significantly not wishing to be labelled. Um, there's also some lay assumptions we make about Indigenous people, but they did fear prejudice the least in their university and post-university life. Um, in terms of Indigenous students as well, just to focus on that group, they saw the least reason to disclose and the highest doubts about the use or the value of disclosing to the university. And students with disabilities and non-English speaking background students place very high importance on the benefits of disclosing their equity status. This all suggests that disclosure doesn't simply happen, that it involves thoughts about the value of disclosure, the effort of disclosure, uh, privacy and confidentiality, and what they're going to get for giving out their information. So the question why disclose seems to be a big one weighing on students. Um, we also looked at how disclosure functions across different universities and there are two broad systems of disclosing equity status at Australian universities. The first is self-disclosure during enrolment and then being followed up by other university equity services. The second is enrolling and then the student going on and self-disclosing later through a separate channel. So that might be an equity service, it might be a language skills service or a learning center, it might be a specific indigenous center. And I've got beneath here one question emerging from this research is which, which system of self-disclosure is better? But also what does better mean? So part of this research is determining what the students want from disclosure how they want to disclose as well. Do they want automatic disclosure, which of course is easier, or do they want to have a little bit more control at how they disclose? 
And so far our qualitative interviews give us mixed results. Many students from equity backgrounds want their disclosure experience to be easier. They want it to be less involved with them. They just want to disclose once to the university and then have a service take care of that later on. On the other hand, students are very wary of the power of the information, the weight of the information they give the university and value some degree of control over that. So there seems to be a challenge with all disclosure services of balancing the ease of disclosure and automating disclosure with the need of, a, of the student to have control of their information. Um, so that's a brief introduction to what our study is focusing on um, and some of our suggested results so far. Um, Rita, do you have anything that you might want to add at this point? If you're not muted, that is. Um, hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. It's Rita Kaczewska's Hayes here. Um, I was, was muted. I was wrapped in what you were saying. Um, yeah, so at this point, basically, the study has been, we commenced, we were given the funding, we commenced probably seriously, it was about March this year. So there have been a number of staff who've been involved, and of course, we have had lots of interesting discussions just about the whole nature of disclosure, not even the purpose. But unfortunately, the funding that we were provided is, is restricted. So we need to stick to task and follow through to look at the whole process and um, enhance enhancing self-disclosure across Australian universities. What we are producing at the end of this study, which will be completed by March next year, the final form and the papers written up, is a set of guidelines for Australian universities about disclosure and also recommendations for further research. So that's the, per in the end, this is what we'll be producing. So that's why we are strongly encouraging uh, universities across Australia, staff and students and academics to get on board and be involved so that we can have uh, work together towards looking at uh, the best advice that we can apply provide Australian universities on processes of disclosure. That is separate though, of course, behind the whole nature of disclosure. There are many, many great conversations that we've had along the way and I've been in the field for about 20 years and this is, it always seems, particularly in disabilities, it always seems to come back to this whole concept and the concern and the issue around disclosure. We have services, we go have great programs, we have initiatives, but unless we can communicate that to students and meet their needs, then really, um, you know, this is where we're at the point of saying then what is this, what is it all about if we're not actually encouraging the right students, the students who want to disclose or need to disclose, to disclose. So it's providing them the information, it's communicating with them at the right time, it's listening to students across universities and I think it's being able to somehow break that into and bring that into our bureaucratic administrative processes as well. So that's what we've been finding with the two-pronged approach with looking at how universities encourage and I uh, guess support the process of disclosure uh, by students. This is all about students, not about staff at this point. And secondly, then we're also looking at how we can, uh, for those students who do feel the value and wish to disclose, how we can actually make that experience easier and also uh, more productive, I guess, for students. But yes, it's been a very interesting process. We are presenting um, at a couple of conferences through the year. And as the year goes on, we've got a web page uh, that has the latest data that we've been collecting. We've had, Matt's got all the latest figures on the numbers of universities that we have who have been involved in this project up until now. We are still collecting data, so we've got a couple of months of still collecting data, but we're doing the analysis. And what's been really, really interesting is the uh, interviews that have been done with students across Australian universities. Really, really interesting, and across the three cohorts, because many common issues arise. Um, and that we've got a few case studies, if anybody's interested as well, that we can talk through. But yeah, Colin, have you got anything else to add? Good afternoon, everybody. This is Colin Clark, um, colleague of Matt and Rita, and um, happy to be here. Uh, I've been going through some of the feedback from the surveys, and in addition to the questions that um, Matt has described, uh, we've also asked for just gen students to comment generally on reasons for um, 
for reasons why they might be reluctant to disclose. And I'll talk about this is the one on the screen is actually the, the students with disabilities. Um, and you'll see there's, uh, I sort of recoded their comments into a few, of, and this is just the first rough coding. We may combine these a bit or divide them. Um, we've been going through a process of kind of textual analysis. But you'll, um, a common one is that the students don't want to be seen as receiving special treatment. And you often see that from the indigenous students and to a lesser extent from the non-English speaking background as well. There's this perception that if you get support, then somehow you're not earning your degree or you're getting an unfair advantage. Um, some of them re reject the label of disability. Like they say, they don't really consider it to be a disability. It's just part of themselves. Um, that's reasonably common. Sometimes people will say they think there's, they perceive academic discrimination. Of course, we don't know if that's, that's at real or whether they're there. But some people have quoted lecturers as saying unkind things. Um, perceive general discrimination just from the student population generally. A uh, few have, well, in addition to those points, mentioned that it's based on past experience, perhaps at high school. Some don't really, I suppose this is similar to the first one, they don't really want to be seen to avoid perceptions of disability, that if they have a particular disability that other people may not understand what it is or may have um, misconceptions, such as um, schizophrenia being seen as kind of a split personality. Um, so they're not, you can never be quite sure what it is you're disclosing or what the person, the, the person you're talking to thinks you're disclosing. Um, there's stigma, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, shame, sometimes they feel they have something to be ashamed of. Um, common one is fearing the implications of disclosure. So once it's out there, will it impact their future careers? Um, and I think there's some support for that um, in the literature that it may impact professional development. Um, simple lack of knowledge of how provisions, adjustments or registration work. Sometimes it's a matter of convenience, like uh, it may be difficult to obtain documentation and if you don't, especially if you don't think you really need any support from the university or if the student is fine managing their own needs, then they may not think it's worth the bother. Qualification actually meant um, some people are not clear what counts as a disability. They say, oh, I get migraines, but I don't really think of it as a, as a disability. Uh, that comes up occasionally. Simple distrust of the university um, and its disclosure process. They may have particularly students with social emotional social emotional issues. Um, and finally, obviously, some belief that there's no benefit to disclosure. Um, for some of the, it's less common for us for the um, students with disabilities, but for indigenous students, we came across the attitude that um, why does anyone need to know? This is just so the university can get more funding or can tick the diversity box. Um, so that was all. That was all quite interesting. Um, they are similar for the other groups. Um, the indigenous students often mention shame, and we're. In the interviews, we're going to be exploring what exactly that meant, um, whether it's shame, they feel there's shame in being indigenous, or in some cases, shame in not being indigenous enough. Like they say that other indigenous students tell them they're too light-skinned to be truly indigenous. Um, or it could be a shame in the idea of special treatment that they're getting the perception they might be getting a free ride. Otherwise, rather similar, lack of knowledge, discrimination, perceptions, um, lack of trust, past experience, 
Um, the, again, the convenience thing because students do need documentation for Indigenous status. Um, and similar and similar categories would apply to non-English speaking background. Um, it's much more common for them, for the non-English speaking background students to say there is no benefit. And 72% of our respondents have said that their English is the same as an, as an educated native speaker of English. So in fact, for them there is no benefit that we can see. Um, anything you want to add there, Matt? Um, no, can you all see the, the slides here with feedback from students with a disability? We can, Matt. Thank you. Brilliant. Yep. So these Here's are some of the answers we've had so far, um, which highlight that a lot of these students do have real concerns about their privacy, about the confidentiality of their information, um, and especially these fears that Colin went over with Indigenous students as well of um, impacting reputations and job in, and job opportunities later on. Uh, so one of the issues that this research has uncovered so far is that a lot of students aren't aware of how secure their information is. They often feel like there's, they have a lack of control of this information that they've disclosed to the university. And universities could do well and, and, and could encourage a lot, a lot more disclosure by making it very clear how that information is, is handled, um, how that information is kept, and what can and can't be done with it. Um, so a huge boost to disclosure rates could come from simply making, making our message clearer and making sure students are aware of what disclosure actually involves and what that means for them, rather than having a mystery surround it or having students not disclosing because they're really unsure. Um, Matt, it's Rita here as well. What the other part to that um, scenario is that also why should they disclose? Mm. Apart from the fact of handling that information, I think universities are fairly poor probably in um, communicating. I won't speak for every university and I think our university, I'll say UNSW, still has quite a way to go to actually communicate with students about the benefits of some of the other programs and so forth that they could take part in. But of course we all hope that there's uh, and this is something interesting to see about disclosure rates across universities, and I think this is something for further research, is also looking at the practice of universal design. So many universities, for instance, if uh, you have a hearing impairment and you, or other sort of uh, print disability, if you have audio uh, descriptions, captioning, in a sense, then there's no reason for somebody to disclose for that purpose to get that access to that accommodation. Um, and we're hoping, of course, that there many universities are having far more universal design principles in their teaching and learning, in their physical environment, where there isn't really in some ways a purpose for students to have to disclose. So it's that concept of disclosure and why disclose, but when there is a reason for it and students, it's up to students to make the choice and make informed make inform choices and decisions, then we really need to be uh, very acutely aware of how we're presenting that information, as Matt said, particularly about the nature of the confidentiality of the material. As he said, it's a bit of a conundrum because students sort of want the process to streamline, particularly disabilities, going from school, going through to university. And I think one of uh, the people, actually somebody we have employed in the project now as a staff member who was only recently a student, and she has a disability, she was saying to us that, in fact, disclosure isn't a one-off. Disclosure is a continual lifelong process in many instances when you have a disability. For instance, having a disability at university, you're disclosing every semester. You're dis you, if you need some adjustments or you need some accommodations, you could be disclosing to your tutors again and to your lecturers. And you could, it's, so it's something that uh, students are facing on an ongoing, could be on an ongoing lifelong basis. So there, there is a lot of discussion that's been unearthed and I think the universities, particularly coming back to the focus of this study and our brief, is really looking at how we can make it an easier pro the easier process if possible, also being able to uh, articulate more 
acutely, carefully, and in a, in a much more user-friendly way to students and to also the trusted others, people who are advising and uh, recommending to students about the the benefits of disclosure, we, can, we have a, got a fair way to go for that. But there are a lot of good role models and there are universities and there are great strategies and approaches out there that we're finding too that we're being able to pull together and summarise. But yes, yeah, so it's a two phases of disclosure apart from the actual process is the purpose and the role of disclosure in, in Australian universities. Yeah. Okay, Matt. All right. Um... Well, uh, I think unless any uh, reader or colony have anything else to add, we might as well open the discussion at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I've just had a, a couple of questions um, on the chat pod before we get to the other those questions. Um, I work, somebody's just written, I work in a workplace diversity team in UNSW and wondering if there are any plans on doing a similar study in university staff populations. Hi, it's Rita here. Um, I, I've actually talked to a few people about this and said it would be a wonderful idea and there's actually, as I said, I've even, we've even now got a staff member who was recently a student, we've moved into the staff zone with her, so we're finding it a whole new ball game and she is too. But uh, we don't know of any. I'd suggest we're working through uh, the HEP Funding Authority, Higher Education Participation and Partnerships. I suggest um, having a chat to any other sort of major funding or funding groups for staff research, but no, not as far as we know of because the focus is definitely for students. But I think I'm happy to talk about looking at further grants that we can investigate and explore the space, most definitely. And I think it might be a question we could actually put to the equity practitioners um, uh, peak body um, because they actually do have a staff um, equity side, so it might be something that they can actually take on as a, an agenda as well. So I'll raise that with them. That's brilliant because I think there are. Ver it's interesting to Darlene from the students' perspective. They've actually raised some of those more long-term concerns, so that would lead on to being a staff member. So they are very, very, uh, and I think that would then spill back into looking at the whole process of encouraging disclosure amongst the student population if they're concerned about long-term employment and professional impact of, dis yep. of their disclosure. Yeah. Great. Yep. Um, now we might go to um, the, the discussions. Um, we're going to trial something that could just go totally <laughs> um, skew if on us. Um, if you have um, a response to a question, you can raise your hand and we can unmute your microphone. Um, that kind of means that you hopefully have a good system that we can hear you. The other option is you can um, write your questions in the question pod. So the first question that um, the research group um, have asked is how do students disclose at your institution and what are the processes? Has anybody got um, anything they would like to say there if they want to put their hand up and we can unmute or they can um, respond? No hands at this stage? No? Um, we have a person that's um, written in the um, question pod um, as a t um, at a TAFE here where disability employment services regularly sponsor students to enrol in courses but students often report they were discouraged from disclosing on enrolment forms etc by staff. That's um, it's quite weird isn't it if it's coming from the employment services? I don't know if you guys want to make any comment to that. We did see a similar comment on one by one of our students saying they'd been advised by um, some equity practitioner not to disclose because it might create um, difficulties in their future employment. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how common that is. Hopefully, there are ways to protect student confidentiality so that it's. Um, it doesn't raise professional concerns, but yeah, um, that was it. Yeah, I noticed that, Colin. It was. I was hoping it wasn't. It didn't come from a university staff person. So, um, yeah, because it's quite a concern. 
Um, just the next question then is what are the barriers for disclosure and I think um, in your presentation you identified um, a lot of those that certainly students and, um, and from your research you've discovered. I wondered if anybody else online have um, come up with anything different or have any thoughts on, on that. You're all being very quiet. This is our first time we've had this kind of discussion. So <laughs> it's not working. Oh, we've got a hand. It's exciting. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, yes. Um, but, yeah. So, Ka okay. Kathy. <laughs> oh, no. No, this is the trouble. We might get some feedback. So, um, Another question is how um, has your institution identified and approached these barriers? Anybody want to have some feedback, feedback into that? So we might try you, Michelle. See if Michelle, um, have yeah. you got a response to that? Look, um, yeah, I'm fairly new in my role uh, at, U at UVSA in South Australia in the um, managing the access and inclusion services there. So one of the, I, I, I'm not surprised by any of the, the um, findings to date. Um, I've worked in the disability field for a long time, particularly in employment as well. So disclosure has been a big part of what, I, what I've uh, done over the years. So um, look, I think, I think we're, we're looking at, at, at ways we can streamline the disclosure process. Um, in the future for, for our university. It's a, the, I guess the barriers are that you're dealing with multiple systems and areas over which you have little control. Um, so I would like to see two, I think, two options for people. One is an automated system where people are um, happy to disclose and it's part of the enrolment process. But then I think we also need to promote that dual pathway for those people who want to wait and see. I think that's valid, a valid reason for people with disabilities to see how they go. Often people are only just accepting their disability, so there'll be a lot of grief and loss and lack of disclosures related to that, I would imagine, um, given the age cohort. So yeah, I, I think that we, we need to take a more student-centric approach um, and and look at what works for, for, for the students versus what works for the university. Right, thank you, Michelle. Any anybody want to comment on Michelle's discussion there? Yes, thanks, Michelle. Um, I was interested in the automated response because we actually have, for the last year or two, we actually have had a system um, at UNSW called Navigate Me, and okay. um, that's a that's a kind of um, online tool that where students answer a series of questions about their needs, and it covers everything from administrative processes to personal life uh, to academic study and they answer all these questions like yes or no or just responses to statements like I have trouble I have trouble writing essays for example and at the end of it the student clicks a button and they get a an action plan of people they can be referred to and it doesn't rec doesn't sort of constitute formal disclosure, they don't go into the system unless they choose to do so, but it does recommend that if you if you see the service, this is what they can do for you. Um, and we have compared the um, we have compared the formal disclosure rates with um, those on Navigate Me and it does seem to bring out people who haven't formally disclosed. Um, so I think that may be part that may be a part of the solution here. I certainly agree we need to be more student focused. Any comments, Reid? Yes, yeah, thanks for bringing up Navigate Me. Thanks, Michelle, for that comment. It's, it's very true. I think we do need that flexibility in the system, but I've always been, and Navigate Me is a project, an online interactive digital tool that I started about six years ago here. And what I was always concerned about was students that who felt that they wanted to seek advice but not be judged. It, uh, they, we wanted to look at a way that it could be confidential yet supportive and they could get help when they needed it. But it's also something if they're sitting there at 2 o'clock in the morning and they think, wow, you know, I really can't go on anymore with these studies. I just 
don't think there's anyone at the uni who can help me and here at UNSW it would be very easy to withdraw without any intervention at all and that's yeah. at the end of your university degree. So that's where it all came from and I agree that at that point it's really interesting to see where students are just thinking, I, do I have a disability? Is it really? What is a disability? All I know is, you know, I have a difficulty concentrating, I'm, um, at times I have, uh, you know, depression or whatever, but they don't see it as a disability and they don't see that that can help them. So that's where I think it's really important that one, students are able to make better informed choices with the way we present information, when we prevent it, but also hand in hand with that is the administrative side. How can then we reflect that within the process within the university to make it easy for students, as Colin said, make it more student-centred as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, for that great question. I'll um, move on to Jackie now, Jackie Wyman from WA. If I can find you to unmute you, Jackie. My system's a bit slow here. So, Jackie, did you have a question oh, to yes, add? More a comment. It's really hard to... Um, really identify a reason for students to disclose on enrolment uh, and I think there are different practices at different institutions like at some universities I know students have to disclose to access disability services and we don't make them do that because students really do have significant concerns about disclosure and sadly there are cases where they do face attitudes and discrimination. But I guess my concern is about the inconsistency possibly of statistics across the institutions and when these statistics are linked to funding, um, that creates some real issues and I guess if there are some guidelines it would be nice to see if that could help to address some of those issues or provide some guidance about what's okay and what's not. Um, yeah, that was the, those were just my thoughts on that. All right, thanks, Jackie. Anybody want to respond to Jackie? Okay. okay. Um. Yeah, um, <laughs> Go on, team. I, I think that's great because it is interesting what you bring up, uh, Jackie, as well, is what we've been finding about different practices across the universities. And again, comparing that to what students have said, because students have said also they wish it was more streamlined and that how many of us know, for instance, if, if they are seeking support from a disability service, which they do have to register, and my example previously is not in every case because some universities have far more inclusive practices with their teaching and learning materials and so forth, but those students though at that point needing to, I guess, know how and if they want to disclose where to disclose to. So those figures that we have, we've actually compared a number of data sets across these cohorts. So when students have the opportunity, if they wish to disclose, to disclose. So we get a lot of uh, the information from UAC. The data is sent through to universities, so students have disclosed to UAC. That comes through to disability services. We also here have, uh, and across many universities, the general that's more when you enrol, are you, you know, Torres Strait Islander, Indigenous, do you have a disability, which type, and at that point of course there is no onus for any service support or delivery or medical documentation and then the third opportunity is when students do disclose and register with a service to get to, such as disability services to get a service. So that we've also done some comparison of those differences in the data sets as well and it's not, they're not always exclusive of each other. There's a lot of overlap when people decide to disclose because they need a service at a later time. But it's certainly what's interesting is though when students get, are able to choose at enrolment a box to say if they belong to one of these equity groups with not necessarily having any commitment to a service provision. So that's an interesting group as well, which of course we do get a larger number of, of students who do uh, disclose at that point. But no, I agree, it's, of course it's, it's very much up to the student and you're right, some universities and some, uh, actually some courses, I know medicine, uh, for instance, they own us and the, there is pressure on students to disclose up front. Okay, um, I've just, um, Maren McCracken, I think has got some comment to make as well. I've unmuted you, Maren, and then we'll move on to, um, I think, Christy. 
Um, look, I think it's probably been said now, but I, I just to agree, I think there are different um, practices and certainly at our institution at Deakin, when students register with the disability service with their permission, we do tick that box on enrolment and my sense is that the numbers of students with disability has grown significantly. Um, as distinct from some of the other equity groups and some of that is because some of this of these practices that are happening at some universities and not others so where we are actively um, uh, supporting students to tick that that box on enrollment with the the misgivings that Jackie um, uh, outlined before and the other couple of reasons are I think that and this is the dilemma and Rita you touched on universal design before you know the other concern I have is that we've got more and more students registering because they need adjustments because maybe we're not approaching um, education in in as good and inclusive way as we used to and also um, I think the um, the understanding over the last probably five years or, or a little bit more that people with mental health issues um, can um, be assisted with adjustments where they may used to not have thought that disability services were for them has also um, led to the increase. But it is really interesting to see those figures of how many students, you know, that the that the 17% compared to the 18.5% is really interesting in that disability area. Excellent. Thank you, Maren. Any comments to that from the group? I'll just jump in quickly and say, here, here, Maren, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying and, and, and I've also, I've been in the field for quite a while and I have seen, for a while there we were seeing that there was a, a focus and there was a lot more collaboration with uh, universal design and it was all the go and, but now I think with many universities moving to a range of technologies um, and I know our university is struggling with that because we always seem to be one step behind in the area of disabilities and mm. everyone still, unfortunately, across the board, I think people still feel it's almost the afterthought and, I, yeah, I agree. I feel that technology, people think, is the way ahead and it's going to solve a lot of these issues when we know it brings up a whole range more. And also online uh, teaching as well there's many more factors that people don't consider. It's not the panacea and the fix-all, most definitely. But the okay. figures are really interesting. Yeah, I've, I've been sitting back going, wow, this is quite, um, quite fascinating. And mental health, particularly psychological mental health. We know that um, students, we didn't have the, everyone says, oh, the numbers are growing. The numbers are growing. But I think it's, it's the whole discussion around disclosure and people realising, I know when I started in the field 20 years ago, um, mental health wasn't really considered. It was around sensory and we had mobility, but um, people were saying, oh, but if you have a, a psychological disorder, oh, no, that's not really a disability. And yet we know that's taking up a lot of time with arrangements uh, when it comes to flexibility, course adjustments and so forth. So that is a, that is a real area of growth and it has been actually found, uh, supported in the stats that we're looking at too. Excellent. Thanks, Rita. Um, we just have another question around um, from Todd, Todd Sullivan. Do you have any insight trends of disclosure? Is this being driven by increased Oh, sorry, I'm not very good at reading by increase by just disclosure or actual inroads into participation. So do you have any insight trends of disclosure? Um, could you repeat that, sorry? Yep, so I'm just wondering if you have, um, do you have any insight trends of disclosure? So I suppose if there's any, um, you know, trends of has disclosure gone up um, so first? Um, and if it has gone up, is it being increased um, by um, the actual inroads into the participation because the participation rate of people um, from equity groups have increased or um, is it um, more around, um, you know, people are keen to disclose? I think that's I'm um, kind of paraphrasing the question. <laughs> well, although the, the study is not longitudinal, so this is really providing a snapshot of the situation as it is right now, um, our background research has confirmed that students are disclosing equity status at a higher rate. So students that are from equity groups at a greater rate than ever before are letting their institutions know, which is yeah. valuable and really important for service provision. Um, 
However, it's, uh, there's still a long way to go and the statistics I've got up on the screen right now, 9.7, nearly 10% of students with a disability, nearly 14% of Indigenous students and 16.5% of non-English speaking background students. Um, those are still huge numbers when you consider that these three equity groups make up just under a quarter of the total university population in Australia. So there's, yeah. there's still a long way to go with um, students from equity groups making themselves visible to their institutions if they want to. Yeah. Um, just a question from me, and I know we discussed it a little bit prior. I know one of the, the issues from the disability sector in particular is around the categor categorisation of disability um, for the disclosure to the, um, for the Department of Education and Training, that that category is quite limited um, and often people don't we don't get kind of a true reflection of people with a lived experience of mental illness or on the autism spectrum. In this research, have those kind of questions been put to students with disabilities if the questions were different, if it identified their disability in particular, would they be more likely to disclose, etc.? Not directly. Oh, sorry, Colin, was that you that I interrupted? So I was going to say, we did have a question um, that asked about the, the um, uh, asked about the category of disability for each of our respondents, um, and that was broken down into physical, cognitive, sensory, social, emotional, carer, with the option prefer not to um, prefer not to say or other. Um, and the most common categories were um, social, emotional, uh, followed by cognitive and physical. Um, there do seem to be, we're still sort of analysing the, the data, so um, I can't give you a definitive answer yet, but the, um, there do seem to be differences between the disability types and willingness to disclose. Um, the people with social emotional disabilities seem more inclined to distrust universities and perhaps because some disabilities are more concealable than others, they have in a sense more choice about whether to disclose. But it's Rita here, I'll just jump in quickly, but no, we don't actually have a question though directly saying do you know do the categories fit your needs or do you understand what the categories are? Um, different universities have different categories across the board, but that at this point, unfortunately, that's we don't have time, we don't have the scope or the funds to explore those options or questions. But students, it's interesting though, Darlene, because students haven't actually come forward and said it's because of the category types or it's because of the way the questions are framed. Um, Matt, could you do you want to add to that? Um, out of the interviews, particularly we've been doing, have we had that raised with our students with disabilities? It has been raised that uh, with some of the students that are living with disabilities that they've they've had reservations about the terminology of disability themselves. A lot of these students, although they recognise that there are obstacles they experience that other students don't, they would they don't identify in their daily lives as living with a disability. Having said that, though, when there's a form in front of in front of these students that says, do you identify as, as having a disability or do you have these disabilities or this disability, um, they do know what it's talking about. So whatever their personal identifier is, they're aware that a disability is something that their situation could be considered as. Having said that though, there are students that we've interviewed as well who have said that they haven't disclosed to the university because they don't identify as living with a disability even where they do have significant obstacles, physical or mental or cognitive. Yeah. So it does come up and, yeah. and how, much, how representative that is, is something that we're still gathering data on. Yeah. And I'm probably asking for that pure data kind of process too in the sense of the data that is collected by the Department of Education and Training. Um, it, that's often what we go to for research purposes of how many students are disclosing, ha has there been an increase of students with disability accessing universities. Um, you know, and, and anecdotally, 
probably saying that wrong, um, we're here from universities that students on the autism spectrum or with a lived experience of mental illness has increased, but we actually can't get that out of the, the actual data set that goes to the Department of Education and Training because those two groups actually aren't identified in that data. So it's it's kind of more on, you know, in that research and, and for us as a sector to be able to, you know, put our case forward of, you know, often the complexities of somebody with a, a lived experience of mental illness or autism, you know, requires this approach or so forth. Without that data, we haven't been able to do that. So hopefully from this, you know, the department will, you know, re-look at that. All right, so we haven't got yeah, any more... Oh, quickly, quickly yep. darling, yep. one more there. Yep. Yeah, very true. That's a really good point you made. But also the other factor we've... T uh, we've looked at and we've touched on through this research is of course with disabilities, it could be multiple disabilities and how do universities cope with managing that level of information when we're talking about students with multiple disabilities and how do we capture that data and so forth. So it is, yeah. it is a really, really interesting topic um, but it's just something we've just very briefly touched on as well ourselves and how do students approach that? Do they approach saying, I have multiple disabilities or do they disclose only what they feel is relevant to disclose at the time or necessary? Yeah. Excellent. Now, just we're going to keep just keep in the. Ugh, I've lost my voice today. We're going to um, keep the question pod open for a little while. If people want to answer any of those questions um, in the question pod, that data will be collected and we'll give that to the um, the group. Um, so that they actually have that information. So if you wanted to answer any of the questions that we had up about how your institution approaches um, disclosure, um, et cetera, that would be fantastic because the more information they get, the better picture they will form. Now, Matt, on the screen, you've got a couple of links. So did yep. you want to talk to that? Well, the first link, I'm not sure whether you can click on it or not. You can follow no, my giant mouse. <laughs> and it's like this all the time. This isn't for your ease. This is for mine. Um, the first link is to the student survey, uh, which is surveymonkey.com slash. We'll, we'll send it out to everybody that's yeah. registered today, so that's fine. Uh, we do have a student survey and a staff survey. So for all the staff members that are listening, they can do that survey. Um, what we're really focused on at the moment, though, is gathering student data, and in particular, Indigenous student data. Um, we've got far less Indigenous students responding to the surveys and any policy or process uh, outcomes that this study has then will have a limited Indigenous voice um, if we can't get those figures back up. So if you have any students that would be interested in doing the survey, maybe if you're giving a lecture or a seminar in the near future, you might want to put the link to this survey up at the end of the lecture or seminar or email it out to any students who might be interested. Um, and that would be a huge help to boosting our numbers and to getting a lot more and a lot richer data on the student disclosure experience. Okay. Um, so if you're interested, we'd appreciate that greatly. Excellent. And that may be... If we can come out, we're happy to run some focus groups, also do it online via Skype. So there's a multiple range of ways that we're more than happy to engage with you, engage with us. Yep. I might suggest also maybe another email out to EFIA um, to say that that's the group you're still lacking in, I suppose, as far as, um, you know, getting the right people to understand, um, that might be the best group to, to contact. But once again, as a, the disability sector, we're certainly happy to promote that as well for making sure you, you get the voice of the Indigenous population for the sector. Um, just one final thing. In your presentation, you identified you actually had a website. Does that exist now or is that coming up? Yes, it does. It does exist, Darlene. Have you got that, Matt, as well? Uh, yeah, I can bring that up right now. This is our okay. website now, right now at student.unsw.edu.au slash enhancing disclosure. Uh, we do have survey links here as well as our email address if you're interested in arranging a focus group at your university through Skype. Uh, we can do phone interviews as well. Um, we're flexible and technology is pretty incredible so we can work around whatever limitations of time or distance you might have to overcome. And there's some information on us as presenters 
um, and additional links and some additional information here as well if you're interested. That's brilliant. Well, thank you, Matt, Colin and Rita. It was fantastic to hear about where the project's up to now and um, I, I hopefully um, from the presentation you'll get um, significant more engagement from um, us as a sector as well as us um, enc encouraging other sectors to join in. Um, I thank everybody else for participating today. Um, it was fantastic to trial the um, talking um, so um, and having the questions come in. So thank you for those people who actually had a say and also um, put their questions up into the question pod. So um, at this, thank you. And so we will say goodbye now and, and thank everybody for participating and have a great rest of your Tuesday. Take care. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.